Even in spite of a pandemic, life is still and indeed beautiful. If you think of a lifelong happy friendship or a marvelous family day with several generations around a common table or magnificent natural scenery or a painting that captures that brief moment when the moonlight is playing with the surface of a lake or a poem that in just a few words gives a profound insight. But human life is never just beautiful. I think it's safe to say that we all know life and its challenges, its disappointments, its frustrations, its conflicts, big and small, its fears and its illnesses, including the contagious ones. Christian Science presents new and fresh insights into the nature of God, new and fresh insights into the nature of who we are, the children of God. These new and fresh insights can lift us above the discords and limitations of human life and show us who we truly are as manifestations of the divine and how we truly are. Always happy, always at peace, and always well. Mary Baker Eddy, the discoverer of Christian science, knew human life very well. She grew up in the 1820s and 1830s in the part of the United States called New England, where the city of Boston is, for example. Specifically, she was the sixth in the family of six children on a family farm in New Hampshire. As a little girl, she loved God dearly, and she delighted in her family. Because she was often sick, she couldn't attend school regularly, but she was intensely interested in learning. She was intensely interested in the world around her. She was strongly encouraged in her studies by her scholarly brother, Albert. She was strongly encouraged, especially by her mother, to put into practice the teachings of Jesus. At age 22, Mary Baker married George Glover, a builder, and together they moved to a very different part of the United States, to North Carolina. There, after six months, and in spite of their earnest prayers, he died suddenly of yellow fever. Yes, a contagious disease, leaving her alone and expecting. She returned to New Hampshire, where she lived initially with her parents and later with a sister. When her son was born, she named him George after the father. He was a handful. He was a wild, energetic little boy. And because she was often sick, it was challenging for her to care for him. Somewhat later, the rest of her family, concerned about the health of the mother and against her wishes, had her son taken away and placed in the care of another family. Of course, that was very hard for her. And I think that it was one of the reasons why she wanted to marry again, to form a family circle to receive back her little son. She married Daniel Patterson, an itinerant dentist. But his income was never regular enough that they could enjoy much financial stability. And towards the end of the marriage, he was no longer faithful. Although she worked at saving that marriage during more than 20 years, finally, she divorced him. And the family with whom her little son was living moved to what was then considered to be the far west, to Minnesota. And he was told that his mother had passed on. She heard nothing from him for more than five years, and didn't see him again for close to 25 years. Of course, we all have challenges. How was Mary Baker facing hers? By striving even more to put into practice the teachings of Jesus. By turning even more to her Bible. She knew that the Bible is filled with the promise that God is always present to help us in moments of difficulty. But how to prove that practically in the midst of loneliness, poverty, and ill health? 
During this time, she explored various methods, methods of improving her health. Conventional medicine, homeopathy, and even what we today would call hypnotism. For a time, she used the services of a well-known mental healer, Phineas Quimby, and she seemed to be better. But only for a time. And finally, she was disappointed because the basis of his system of healing wasn't the spiritual and moral principle that was the basis of the healing works of Jesus. In 1866, she had a breakthrough. She was walking to a temperance meeting. That was a kind of meeting that was quite common in that day, organized to try to discourage the consumption of alcohol in society in general. It was in February and winter in Lynn, Massachusetts, not far from Boston. And walking to this temperance meeting, she fell on a slippery sidewalk and because of the fall became unconscious. She was taken to a house that wasn't far from there, and the physician who attended her diagnosed serious internal injuries and didn't think that she would survive. But she came to and asked for a Bible. Then, in a moment of great inspiration, while she was reading one of Jesus' healings, her decades of searching for spiritual answers, her decades of searching for better health, culminated in a healing. She was suddenly well, to the great surprise of her friends. And although she experienced minor relapses over the next few months, she was finally entirely healed, not only of the effects of the fall, but ever after that experience, she enjoyed better health than before. What had she seen? Later, she would write that during those moments of great inspiration, she saw that entirely beyond anything physical, entirely beyond anything biological or organic, was the reality of God as infinite life. And she was at one with this life. And in this relationship of oneness, she had everything that she would ever need, including her health. Throughout history, many people have been healed and then they've simply gone on with their lives. But she wanted to understand how she had been healed. Why was she healed when she was healed? Why not earlier or later? And could the good results be repeated in other cases with other people? Very naturally for her, she turned even more fully to her Bible. And she was taking detailed notes on what she was reading. She was finding that with this understanding of God as infinite life, with this understanding of identity as being the spiritual expression of this life, she could consistently heal other people. And not long after that, she began to teach others how to heal with this understanding. The fact that not just she, but others as well, could heal with this understanding confirmed for her that the power to heal wasn't her personal power, but that she had come to understand the science of healing that was the basis of the healing works of Jesus. These healings were significant physical healings, diphtheria, malaria, tuberculosis, but there was also an important moral dimension to these healings. Often the person healed felt uplifted spiritually. Often the person became a better person, less selfish, for example. By 1875, she had organized all of her notes into what would come to be her main work, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Here's the book here. Now, in this book, she explains how to experience protection, even if in doing one's duty or in doing one's job, for example, one's directly exposed to a contagious disease. She also explains how to be healed of a contagious disease through prayer alone. But before talking more specifically about that, I wanted to read a couple of passages that are perhaps even more fundamental. 
First, this one. The Christ-like understanding of scientific being and divine healing includes a perfect principle and idea, perfect God and perfect man as the basis of thought and demonstration. Perfect God and perfect man as the basis of thought and demonstration. She wasn't saying that humans are perfect. She was saying that beyond anything human is the perfection of God. And each of us in our true spiritual being manifests that divine perfection. Another passage. You can prove for yourself, dear reader, the science of healing and so ascertain if the author has given you the correct interpretation of scripture. Someone who did just that was Asa Gilbert Eddy. And in 1877, they married. And so Mary Baker became Mary Baker Eddy. Speaking of demonstrating this science for oneself, I wanted to recount two personal experiences, one in the context of COVID-19 a little later. But first, about 15 years ago, I began to experience very sharp pains in my lower abdomen. In reality, these were painful episodes that would have lasted two or three hours. I prayed with some of these very ideas that God is my life and that I'm perfect and free as the spiritual expression of God. During this time, I was working for the Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, and in the role that I was playing, I needed to appear to speak in public six times a week. But happily, these painful episodes didn't interfere with that work. They came on different days at different hours. I was so grateful for that. Also, during a part of this time, I was hosting family members, and had they learned that I was experiencing these painful episodes, they would have been very concerned. But they never learned of it. If I was with them and needed to pray, I simply explained that I had work to do, which wasn't surprising. I almost always had work to do. And I was able to go to another part of the house and just be quiet with God. In fact, these painful episodes made me think of the experience of a family member decades before when the person was hospitalized and diagnosed with gallstones. Also during this time, I received help from first one Christian science practitioner and later from another. And I should say that a Christian science practitioner is a person who gives his or her full time to helping others in prayer. Together, yes, we prayed, we talked about passages in the Bible and in science and health. I was so grateful for their help. The painful episodes stopped after about two or three weeks. Well, they stopped until they came back again about five months later, but this time I was very much ready to face them with a great sense of authority and a great conviction of my present perfection as the spiritual reflection of this one life. Well, the pain stopped entirely, and as I said, that healing took place about 15 years ago. Such a healing has as its basis a higher concept of identity. The basis of my prayers was that I'm spiritual as the spiritual reflection of this one life. Such a healing has as its basis a higher concept of God. Who is God? Christian science teaches that he or she, instead of being one thing amongst many things in the universe, instead of being one entity amongst many entities in the universe, that in reality, God is infinite. God is all. But how can that be? 
How can God be infinite? How can God be all if we live in a world made up of things? Mary Baker Eddy found in the scriptures a sense of God as being infinite, unopposed love. The only life, the only intelligence, the only mind, the only substance of the universe, and that this was the basis of the teachings and healing works of Jesus. Of course, we can read in 1 John that God is love. Also, we can read in the Gospel according to Luke what has sometimes been called the pearl of parables, the parable of the prodigal son. In this parable, recounted by Jesus, a father whose heart is filled with love, whose heart is filled with compassion, accepts back his second son, who has treated him most disrespectfully, and who has simply gone off and wasted his inheritance. When the son realizes he has nothing left, not even anything to eat, he decides to go back to the father, but he doesn't think that the father will take him back as a son, maybe as a servant, at least in that way, he'll have something to eat. But when he's going back, the father sees him from a long ways off, and the father runs to meet him, throws his arms around him and kisses him. And he says that he wants to celebrate because he says, this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. With this parable, Jesus was indicating the nature of God as infinite, you could even say unconditional love for each and every one of us. What Mary Baker Eddy was seeing was truly revolutionary and was challenging some of the most basic assumptions of human thought itself. She wasn't seeing that there are difficulties and discords and diseases, including contagious diseases, and then there's also infinite love. She was seeing that infinite love is so infinite that it actually exists instead of an imperfect material creation. In other words, there isn't a basic human context in which suffering is normal, natural, and inevitable for every one of us. And then there's also infinite love. She was seeing that infinite love is so infinite that it actually excludes the existence of anything other than this love and its expression. I think it's easy to see that with the starting point being this infinite, unopposed love, we may need to rethink who we are. The standard way of thinking is, well, we're physical creatures or essentially physical creatures who are evolving physically in a physical universe that itself is evolving physically. But the first thing that we can say right off is that each of us simply shines eternally as the very image and likeness of this infinite unopposed love. And that therefore identity is not subject to being diminished. Identity is not subject to being oppressed. Identity is not subject to being divided one person against another. Identity is not subject to being contaminated. Here's an analogy to help you see exactly what I mean. Think of a building with three stories. So you have the ground floor, the second story, and the third story. Each of these stories is going to represent a concept of identity, a concept of who we are. The ground floor could represent a concept of us as being exclusively physical. So the person is born physically, shaped by the genes of his or her parents, uh, shaped by 
the person's first experiences, later by other experiences. So the person is made up of chemicals and atoms and so on. So the person lives a certain number of years. Hopefully the person loves at least a little bit. And then the person is no more. That's one concept of identity. The second story could correspond to a sense of identity as being essentially physical. So the person is living physically. But then in addition, the person has a soul inside the body. So the, the, the body lives a certain number of years and then the body is no more. But the soul survives, although unfortunately nobody knows exactly in what form. That's a second concept of identity. But I want to talk to you about a third concept of who we are, this third story. According to this concept of identity, what gives us our identity, what makes us who we are, isn't how tall we are or our age or even the color of our skin. What makes us who we are is that each of us is a unique expression of the qualities of this infinite unopposed love. Qualities like joy, wisdom, strength, intelligence, beauty. It's from this third sense of ourselves that all good flows into human life. It's because we're spiritual and intelligent as manifestations of this infinite love. That's why we can show forth that intelligence by doing our jobs better, for example. It's because we're strong and loving as expressions of this infinite love. That's why we can show forth that strength and that love by being better parents, by being better grandparents, for example. It's because wholeness and wellness are built right into who we are as the manifestations of this love. That's why we can show forth that wholeness and that wellness by being healthier. If we're purely spiritual, how do you explain those other two concepts, the ground floor and the second story? Well, something that we can say right off is that seen from an absolute point of view, they have no reality. They're simply human concepts. They're simply human perceptions. They're simply human beliefs. But these human concepts, these human perceptions are neither created by this infinite love that fills all space, nor are they even known to this infinite love. And in fact, these human perceptions, these human concepts, they have no actual substance. That said, the human perception of things, the human appearance of things, can't help but manifest in some degree the beauty of spiritual life. So all of the beautiful things about human existence and I mentioned just a few of those things at the start of this talk, are to be cherished, appreciated, loved, celebrated, not because they represent the absolute spiritual reality that Mary Baker Eddy found in the scriptures, but because even as a human perception of things, they have great value. And of course, as we grow spiritually, all of the beautiful things about human existence become more beautiful as we see them in a more spiritual way, while all of the bad things about human existence, step by step, simply fade away because they have nothing actually holding them in place. They, they, they have no rock that is sustaining them and maintaining them. We, on the other hand, are rooted and grounded, absolutely anchored in this infinitude of love. And that's why we exist in complete security. That's why our perfection is always intact. That's why we can show forth that perfection by overcoming sin, for example. 
And in Christian science, it's very important to overcome sin. But we overcome sin not as a part of identity, but as a lie about identity. As a lie about identity because identity is the spiritual expression of this infinite unopposed love and is just as sinless as this love is sinless. When a dog comes out of a lake or a river, well, what does the dog do? Dog shakes himself off to be free of the water, to be, to be dry. Well, the water is no part of the dog. In the same way, we can shake off sin because it's clearly no part of who we are. There's a passage in the Bible that says just that. This is in the Bible book Ephesians, and I'm going to read that to you from the revised, pardon me, the new revised standard version. This is from Ephesians ch chapter 4. It says, You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. True righteousness and holiness. Well, that's what characterizes the, the daughter or the son of God. The person who best showed forth this true holiness, this true righteousness, was Jesus. When you read the Gospels, it seems as if Jesus is always feeling his oneness with God. It seems as if he's always seeking to know and to do the will of God and actually accomplishing God's will. I think that it was for that reason that Jesus was unafraid to reach out and touch the man who was filled with leprosy and to bring him healing, even as he brought healing to so many others. And not only did Jesus heal people, but he also reformed them. He reformed them by seeing him, the, the person in the light of this infinite, unopposed love. Jesus showed forth perfectly the Christ. The Christ is the true idea of God as infinite love. But the Christ existed before Jesus, and Jesus manifested perfectly the Christ. But the Christ is with each of us right here this afternoon in this church building. The Christ is with each of us always. It's the Christ that cheers us up if we're feeling low. It's the Christ that gives us strength. It's the Christ that awakens us to our true spiritual being. It's the Christ that heals us. That was the experience of a friend of mine. The year was 1984 and she was in the hospital. She had just undergone an operation and the doctors had discovered a number of tumors in her lower abdomen. The doctors hardly knew what to recommend in terms of treatment. They thought perhaps an exploratory operation and then maybe chemotherapy, but frankly, they didn't hold out much, much hope that she would be living much longer. So she was in the hospital, but she wasn't receiving any medical treatment. What she was doing was she was praying. She was studying the Bible and science and health. She was also receiving help in prayer, Christian science treatment from a Christian science practitioner. Together, the two of them were striving to see the health and the holiness that this woman would always have as the very daughter of God. Her husband, a lovely and dear man, practically begged her to have the operation. So she decided to go ahead with it. But this time, the doctors didn't find one single tumor. In fact, their words to her after the operation were, you're clean as a baby. She was completely healed of those tumors. This healing took place in 1984, 
My friend is very active in her church. She has an active family life and a wonderful circle of friends. You can hardly imagine her gratitude. Thinking this way, perfect God and each of us perfect now as the reflection of God sometimes requires a certain inner discipline to, to actually demonstrate. Perhaps you have a neighbor who simply gets mad at you and you have no idea why. It requires perhaps a certain inner discipline to not react, but to turn to God in prayer, to see that neighbor in the light of the infinitude of God's love, to see if there's some step that might be taken to reconcile with the neighbor. Or perhaps you have a family member who, for the last decades, has had a behavior that's been so problematical for the rest of the family. It requires perhaps a certain inner discipline to continue to love that person and support that person, even as they reform and stop that behavior that's been such a big problem. So I'm being very frank with you. Thinking this way sometimes is a lot of work and requires a lot of discipline, even a lot of selflessness. But I'm also being very frank with you when I tell you it's definitely worth it. Because time and again, I've seen thinking like this bring healing to individuals, to families, to neighborhoods. I think that it may require a certain inner discipline to think this way in the midst of a pandemic. And we might even ask ourselves if that's responsible the answer to that question is yes. It's that Christian science isn't practiced in isolation, but Christian science reaches, uh, teaches that we are to reach out and put our arms around the whole world in prayer and be uplifted with the whole world in prayer. Christian science teaches an appreciation of all good human things. That certainly includes an appreciation of the nurse who spends long hours at the hospital caring for others. That certainly includes an appreciation of fellow citizens who are cooperating with public health authorities and maintaining a certain physical distance, for example. That certainly includes an appreciation of the elected official who's able to communicate certain necessary information in a way that actually encourages people. In my own life, I found that thinking this way provides a definite protection I think I've traveled to some 33, 34 countries around the world, often to countries where the level of public sanitation is not that high. I think I've been to Brazil six or seven times, Brazil where dengue fever is almost always a problem. I can remember having been in Beta, Mozambique some years ago when the city of Beta was being very challenged with malaria. But when I've traveled to these places, it hasn't been with my eyes closed. It's been with my eyes open to see the protecting power of love, the power of love to protect me and to protect everyone. And what I've experienced, at least in some degree, is that to the degree your thought is simply filled with love, filled with goodwill towards others, there's no space left over for fear or for even the image of a disease. And in a sense, you become kind of like... Um, a law of protection to yourself. I remember last year in February and March, I was on a speaking tour in South Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana, and I had just finished speaking in Nigeria, and my throat had become very sore. I asked a friend who is a Christian scientist to pray for me. This was a Sunday. And then late that night, I received an instant message from a sister in, a sister of mine in my family in, in Canada. She said that the Canadian government was asking that all Canadians come back to Canada as quickly as possible while there were still commercial airlines in operation. I prayed about it and decided early Monday morning to try to do my best to get back to Canada as quickly as I could. My throat was still sore, so I asked my friend to continue to pray for me. I will tell you, 
that was a moment of very uncertain human circumstances for me. Would I be able to get flights from Lagos, Nigeria to Ottawa, Canada? Would I be well enough to travel or would I have to spend weeks or months in a hotel room far from home? I wanted to travel. I wanted to be well. But even more, I wanted to obey the golden rule, Jesus' golden rule, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And what that means is if a Christian scientist has a contagious disease and if it's necessary in order to protect others to communicate that he or she has that disease, that's simply the right thing to do. It's simply the practical ethics of the New Testament. So had that been necessary, I certainly would have done that. I prayed, and I prayed with essentially two ideas. First, everything that I get, I get directly and exclusively from God. Just like every ray of light from the sun gets everything that it has directly and exclusively from the sun, not from the other rays. And everything that I could ever get from God is good. Just like everything that everybody in truth could ever get from God is good. I also prayed with the idea that my home wasn't a geographical location, a familiar set of material circumstances. No, my home is the consciousness of this love. And I knew that I have that consciousness. And that therefore in some way I could demonstrate that. I began to call the airlines, but in March of last year, getting through to the airlines was almost impossible. So I started looking online, and after work and prayer, I found an itinerary that would have me leaving the next day. It would have me um, being in five cities altogether, uh, four different countries. It would be two consecutive days of travel, but it looked realistic. So. I purchased the ticket and spent the rest of that day, the rest of that Monday, praying for myself and praying for the world. I woke up Tuesday morning feeling perfectly fine. I thanked my friend for his prayers. I was able to leave the hotel at about 9 a.m. I obeyed meticulously all of the requirements in the airports and in the airplanes, obeyed the spirit and the letter of all the requirements, including going through the thermal scanner in Ghana, I returned home safe and very happy late Wednesday night. And of course, I self-isolated for a couple of weeks, which was what the government was asking those who had come from abroad to do. I wanted to recount that experience so that you would have confidence wherever this pandemic has found you or is finding you, that you can maintain this idea of perfect God and perfect man the basis of thought and demonstration. And if the need is for healing, you yourself have that need, your family, or if it's simply a need to know what steps are right, considered ethical steps towards others, thinking this way will guide you. And whatever steps we're led by God to take, um, as those steps are taken with a sense of love and with a sense of consideration towards others, we can, of course, take those steps with confidence and a great expectation of good. Sometimes, thinking this way can almost change the human character of the person. That was the experience of a friend of mine who learned of Christian science when he was a teenager. He grew up in a low-income family and he didn't really know his father. His father was not really a presence in his life. And one of my friend's favorite activities was going out and drinking with his buddies. But he had a neighbor who was a member of the Christian Science Church. He liked this man. The man was quiet. He had a great confidence in God. He was a person of honesty and integrity. Well, one time this neighbor invited my friend to go with him to church. And in Christian science churches around the world, like this one, there's Sunday school for young people up to age 20. 
So in effect, it was an invitation to go to Sunday school at the Christian Science Church. My friend thought about it and accepted the invitation. And what he heard in that Christian Science Church had a great impact on him. What he heard in that Sunday school impacted him greatly because he heard for the very first time in his life that he has a perfect father-mother divine love and that he is perfect as the perfect expression, as a perfect expression of this perfect father-mother love. He loved that idea. He loved that idea so much that he began attending Sunday school regularly. And do you know what it's like if you have a, a plant that hasn't gotten any water for a week or 10 days and then it finally gets some water, it comes to life? Well, that's really what was happening to my friend. It's as if he is coming to life. The ideas that he was hearing in this Christian Science Sunday School were having such an influence on him. There were lots of changes in his life. One of them was he really liked his friends, but he decided he didn't want to drink anymore. He, he stopped drinking. There were other changes. And then a way opened up for him to be able to go to university. Now, this was surprising. As I said, he came from a low-income family. And this was actually in the United States, where I probably don't need to tell you, university costs a lot of money, usually. He was accepted in the program. He was thrilled. During his four years at university, he worked very hard on his studies. But I believe he worked even harder on himself. He wanted to express so much love towards the professors, towards the other students. Well, now maybe 10 years later, he graduated. Uh, he has a job he loves. He's very active in his community. He and his wife have a little boy. I think that what impresses me most in his case is, no, not that he went to university and now he has a job he loves, but that this idea of God as infinite father-mother love has enriched his life so much. And now he, through the way he's living, is greatly enriching the lives of others. His life has a spiritual and moral orientation that it just never had before. I can hardly think of my friend without thinking of the Ten Commandments. We've probably all seen images of Moses with the Ten Commandments. You can find the Ten Commandments in the Bible book of Exodus. The Ten Commandments have, were very important in the ministry of Jesus. He references them often. The Ten Commandments have been very important in the evolution of humanity. The very first commandment, to have no gods before me, to me that means to recognize this infinite love and live in, in harmony with this love. The next commandment, to have no graven images. We might usually think of a graven image as something that somebody chisels out and then the person would bow down to it. But sometimes graven images can be purely mental. Even a disease itself can be a graven image that we need not worship. In this time of COVID, many of us have been learning new technologies. Well, a concept of ourselves as being not, not very good with technology, you see, that's a kind of a graven image that we don't need to accept. The next commandment, to not take the name of God in vain, that to me means to not, not take the nature of God in vain as infinite love, but to take seriously and to base our lives on that concept. The next commandment, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I love to go to church on Sunday, but I also love to think of my own holiness and the holiness of everyone around me every day of the week. The next commandment, to honor your father and your mother. It just makes good sense to honor everything good in our human parents, even as we honor everything good in those around us. The next commandment, to not kill, obviously important literally, but sometimes people can act a little bit like a kind of a killjoy, maybe by entertaining a limited 
idea of somebody's capacities, for example. The next commandment, to not commit adultery, that certainly means to be faithful within your marriage. It means to strive to always have pure and clean thoughts. I also love to think of it as meaning to be reliable in every human relationship so that if you say you're going to do something, for example, you follow through, you do it. The next commandment, to not steal. To the degree we recognize we have all good from God, we have no desire to steal. The next commandment, to not bear false witness, that means to tell the truth. In Christian science, it's very important to always tell the truth. In fact, truth is a synonym for God in Christian science, so it's very important to be a person of substance, a person of integrity. The last commandment, to not covet, again, that indicates to us that we need to have our eyes open to the infinite good that each of us has as the child of God. I mentioned that each of us has infinite good as the child of God. That was the experience of a friend of mine who made a move clear across the country to accept a new job. Everything was going fine until there were organizational changes and then my, job, my friend no longer had a job at all. What he did have was he had a wife, two small children, and a mortgage. It was a serious situation for him and for them. Perhaps a little bit like the situation for many people in, in this part of California where honestly, he just didn't know how they were going to survive financially. My friend prayed, but he didn't start his prayers with what he didn't have. He started his prayers by thinking of just how great God's love was for them, how great God's love for him was, for his wife, for his two precious children. And then the idea occurred to him, well, God loved them so much, it would just be impossible for God to not meet their needs. So he didn't know how things were going to work out, but he had great confidence that they would. Not long after that, he was offered a job. This job was going to require that he learn new skills, develop new capacities, but he was confident that with God, he could do the work. He accepted the job, now six or seven years later, he's done extremely well at that work. The organization has been greatly blessed by what he's been doing. The whole experience confirmed for him that the love of God would always be there for him and for his family that the love of God would always be there for every person and for every family. You might ask yourself, does Christian science always heal? That's a good question. Mary Baker Eddy discovered Christian science in 1866, and since then, those who've turned and, and applied this science for healing, have faced essentially the same problems as the rest of humanity, including the same health problems. In some cases, they've been healed immediately. In others, they haven't. But the overall record of Christian science is a very strong record of healing indeed. Mary Baker Eddy went on to found the Church of Christ, scientist that has branches in many countries around the world. She served as the pastor of the church as the pastor emeritus of the church. She also founded a series of magazines, the Christian Science Sentinel, which is a weekly magazine, the Christian Science Journal, which is published monthly, the Herald of Christian Science, also a monthly publication. In each and every one of these publications, in each and every issue since more than a century now, are always published verified testimonies of healings. These are healings of everything from cancers to AIDS to blindness, healings of Alzheimer's, healings of eating disorders, 
healings of broken bones and of addictions. When you read these healings, it almost feels like you're reading the, the Gospels in the Bible that are filled with the healings that were affected by Jesus and his disciples. Up until now, some 65,000 such healings have been published. Also, in Christian Science churches, there are Wednesday testimony meetings, and at those meetings, people tell about how they've applied the teachings of Christian Science uh, to bring healing to their own lives and to the lives of their family. Often, human thought is on that ground floor level. But healing always happens to the degree we realize our purely spiritual nature. And of course, it's the joy, it's the privilege, and it's the sometimes hard work of realizing and proving our pure spiritual nature. Well, that's the joy and the privilege of following the perfect example of the master, the perfect example of Jesus. Up until now, all of the examples that I've given you have been of individuals praying for themselves or for their families. But I wanted to illustrate and, and give you an example of how to pray for the collectivity. That could be for your school board, that could be for uh, your city, uh, that could be for a world problem such as racism, for example. This was the problem of, this was the experience of a friend of mine who lived in a, in a developing country. He accepted the position of financial controller of a large government institution, an institution that employed more than 1,400 people. But some two or three months into the job, he came to the realization that employee theft was a tremendous problem. That corruption was taking several forms. First, people were manipulating the computer system with the collaboration of the cashiers and were robbing from the organization in that way. There was the issuing of false receipts there was even the outright theft of equipment. My friend wanted the organization to truly be serving its clients. He wanted the accounting to be in conformity with national and international standards. He wanted the organization to be transparent. He took several steps. First, he modernized the accounting system. He improved the inventory system. He set up a sort of an internal auditing system and he began to work to increase employee salaries. But most especially, he prayed. He prayed so that his eyes would be opened to see the integrity and the honesty and the perfection of each and every one of those 1,400 employees. My friend's efforts to reform the organization were met with stiff resistance. That resistance took a number of forms. First, there was a group of employees that wrote a false report about my friend and then sent that report to his immediate superior and to the minister of finance in his country. All of the allegations were investigated. None of them were true. My friend was recognized as completely innocent. He kept on praying. And then a friend of his said that he had inadvertently overheard a conversation between two other employees. And those two other employees said that really there was just one way to stop these reforms. And that was to eliminate my friend by using witchcraft. Now, I should say in some countries around the world, in some cultures around the world, witchcraft is a way of seeking to personally control another person. I'm not sure about here in California, but in Canada, in office settings, we have our own ways of doing that. That can be things like campaigns of lies, backbiting, backstabbing, 
So every culture has its own ways of seeking to control other people. In this particular culture, it was witchcraft. My friend heard that, but he just kept on praying, knowing that good alone was governing. Not long after that, he was alone in the office. It was a Saturday. He was working, and he suddenly felt a very intense pain in part of his body, and a part of his body seemed paralyzed. He recognized right away that this was impersonal resistance to these reforms that were going to bless everybody, the clients of the organization and the employees and their families. He prayed. Specifically, he prayed with this passage from Science and Health. It says here, your influence for good depends upon the weight you throw into the right scale. The good you do and embody gives you the only power obtainable. He knew that he was embodying good. He knew that his only motivation was to make this organization free from corruption, for the blessing of the clients, for the blessing of the employees, and for the blessing of everybody. It took him a few days of steadfast prayer, but the pain stopped entirely, and he was able to move freely. He just kept on praying. By this time, the senior administration had assigned him a couple of bodyguards because he had received direct threats, but he was unfazed. He was so confident that there is just infinite love and its expression. And then something truly wonderful happened. His colleagues, at the same level as him within the organization, instead of just saying, oh, okay, if you want to do those reforms, you go ahead and do it. No, no, no. They finally got behind those reforms and were supporting those reforms. And not long after that, the entire organization, all of the employees, were supporting the reforms. My friend could see it in the internal audits. He could see it in the books. You could see it in the inventory. It was a great victory for my friend. It was a great victory for that organization in a country where corruption has often been a problem. I don't think my friend ever once had the thought, oh, oh, I'm just one person. I don't think my prayers will do much good. I don't think he ever once had that thought. His conviction was that there's absolutely one infinite love that is unopposed. And God's image and likeness is the very expression of this love. His conviction and his confidence was in that spiritual reality. I wanted to read you one last passage from Science and Health. This is a deep passage about identity that is read towards the end of every Christian Science Sunday service. It's, a, as a matter of fact, the only, it's, as a matter of fact, the last thing that's read um, in Christian Science Sunday School sessions. In it, the author uses the term man to mean men and women in their true spiritual eternal nature. Let me read the passage. There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material, he is spiritual. Let me summarize. I told you a little bit about 
Mary Baker Eddy, how she found in the scriptures a sense of God as being infinite, unopposed love. How she found in the scriptures a sense of identity as being the spiritual expression of this love. How this concept of who God is, this true concept of who we are, comes to each of us wherever we are in human life to strengthen us, to comfort us, to encourage us, to heal us. It comes to redeem us, and it comes to redeem all humanity. I wanted you to have a great sense of confidence so that if you're praying about this pandemic, if you're praying to lessen crime in your part of the, the, the state of California, if you're praying for an improvement in terms of global climate change, whatever you're praying for, you should feel confident. Start your prayers like my friend did with the infinitude of this love and pray from this basis. And of course, our prayers are effective to the degree we live consistently with those prayers. So, for example, let's say that we're praying for greater honesty and integrity amongst elected officials in our own country or in another country. To the degree we live that honesty and that integrity, our prayers in that direction are going to be effective. Just like it's the money you have in your bank account that means that your check is accepted as valid. It's the way we live our lives 24 hours a day. That's what gives power and authority to our prayers so that our prayers become our living and our daily living becomes a prayer. I wanted to heartily recommend an in-depth study of the Bible as a way of seeing even more clearly your pure spiritual nature. I wanted to heartily recommend uh, an in-depth study of science and health with Key to the Scriptures as a way of understanding the Bible and its practical spiritual meaning. I wanted to let you know that uh, this talk has been recorded and it's going to be on the website Prayer That Heals for at least a certain amount of time so you can watch the talk or recommend it to friends as well. I wanted to thank this church for having invited me to give this talk and lastly I wanted to thank each of you for your presence and for your kind attention. Thank you.